All right, question 14 on the math subject GRE practice test. Now what we're told is we have this function f. It's a real value differentiable function on the interval from 0 to 2. And we know the derivative of the function is x squared minus x plus 1. Again, on this interval, and we're asked which of the following statements must be true. For the sake of like test taking strategy, on a problem like this, it's not a bad idea to kind of glance through the five options and see which ones you can sort of verify the quickest. The two that jump out to me as being really easy to verify are D and E. There's not really any ambiguity there. The concavity of a function is completely determined by the sign of the second derivative. Recalling that our first derivative is a quadratic function, we know it's really easy to figure out our second derivative, right? Derivatives of polynomials are probably your favorite. Just glancing at this thing, I know I got 2x minus 1 as the derivative. So then I can just ask myself the question, is 2x minus 1 always positive or always negative on this interval from 0 to 2? And the answer is no. I mean, just thinking about what this graph looks like, it's y equals mx plus b, right? The y-intercept is negative, but the slope is positive. I don't know if you're the visual type, here's the y-intercept, and then the slope, rise to run one, maybe. No idea why I made this a dotted line here. The point is this line, the graph of the second derivative of x, is negative over here and it's positive over here. It's clearly not always positive on this interval nor always negative on this interval. So I know my answer is not d or e. I'd probably argue that the next easiest one to verify is C. So what C is saying is if we have two different X values, which we're calling X and Y confusingly, I would have preferred zero is less than X1 is less than X2 is less than two, but that's just me. Anyways, in that condition, F of X has to be less than F of Y, or in my notation, F of X1 has to be less than F of X2. In other words, for any two x values in this interval, the greater of those two corresponds with the greater y value. All this is saying is that this graph is strictly increasing on the interval from 0 to 2. If it's ever going down or flat, I could find an x value to the right of my other x value with the y value that's not above my other y value. Is that true here? Yeah, absolutely. x squared minus x plus 1 is always positive on this interval, therefore c is a true statement. How do I know x squared minus x plus one is always positive? Well, there's a few ways you could do it, but one way would be to recognize that this is just a transformation of our standard parabola, y equals x squared. So the lowest it's gonna ever get will be at the vertex. The x coordinate of the vertex is always negative b over two a, where a, b, and c are defined to be the three coefficients. In this case, b is negative one. So I have the negative of negative one divided by a is positive one. What I'm saying is the x coordinate of the vertex of the graph of the derivative happens at one half and the y coordinate of the vertex of the graph of the derivative i get by just plugging this one half value into this function so it's whatever one half squared minus one half plus one is equal to we don't even need to evaluate this right one is bigger than one half so just summing these two terms i get a positive number and then i'm adding more positive to it it's clearly going to be a positive number wait what do we just figure out here the lowest the derivative ever gets is when the x coordinate is at one half. And at that x coordinate, the y coordinate, in other words, the slope of this function, is still positive. If it's positive at the lowest point it ever gets, that means it's always positive. If it's always positive, it's strictly increasing. C is a true statement. For A and B, we're asked about some symmetries in this graph. What it means for f of x to be equal to f of two minus x is for the graph of f to be symmetric over the line x equals one. And you can kind of think about that like if I changed all the x's into zeros, this is saying f of zero equals f of two. If I changed all the x's into ones, this is saying f of one equals f of one. And that's also true for non-integer numbers. f of one half is the same as f of one and a half, for example. This statement is just saying that my function is symmetric over x equals one. Well, that can't possibly be the case because we've already figured out that my function is strictly increasing on this interval. So if it's always increasing from zero to two, how can the height at one half be the same as the height at one and a half? Can't be, that's a false statement. Maybe I should be putting in some X's in check marks or something. That brings us to B. I think of these five statements, B is the hardest one to analyze. So what it's saying here, that f of x is the negative of f of two minus x is very similar to what we saw in part a, except now it's not symmetric over the line x equals one. Now the heights of the graph aren't the same to the left and the right of this line of symmetry. They're the opposites of each other. So it's almost like an odd function, except instead of the point of symmetry being the origin, the point of symmetry is at one, zero. All right, I can sketch a little graph. In order for statement B to be true, the graph to the right of this point at one, zero, I don't know, maybe it looks something like this, has to be the same as the graph to the left of one zero, except reflected over the line x equals one, 
and then reflect it over the x-axis. So it looks something like this. If statement B is true, our graph F looks kind of like this. I mean, just based on this criteria, it doesn't necessarily have to have this shape, but the fact that its first derivative is quadratic means the function is cubic. And since the first derivative is positive, we know it's strictly increasing. So could the graph have this shape? In short, no. One argument for why is in order for a graph to have the negative height a given distance to the right of this point as it has that distance to the left of this point, the slope of the tangent line at those two points must be the exact same. If it weren't, if this one were steeper, for example, just take a little step to the right, this one's gone up by more than this one's gone down by, we'd lose this symmetry. So do we have the same tangent line slope to the left and right of this line at x equals one? No because our derivative is a parabola, but the vertex of the parabola is not at x equals one. It's at x equals one half. What that means is the line of symmetry of the parabola is at one half. So the heights of the derivative of points that are equidistant from one half are the same, not one. For that reason, statement B is not the one which must be true. In fact, it must be false. C is the only correct answer. To be fair, after we figured out that C was correct, we wouldn't even consider A and B. So under the pressure of a test, that harder analysis that we did up here never even would have had to happen. Now that I think about it, maybe a more straightforward way to eliminate choice B would be to take advantage of this word, must, here. F is a real valued function. The derivative is x squared minus x plus one. And we're asked which of the following statements must be true. What that tells me is I can pick any function I want F as long as this is its derivative and verify the statements with my choice of F. So since they tell me F prime of X, I could figure out F of X just by taking an antiderivative. I'd get what, one third X cubed minus one half X squared plus X plus C. Initially, I didn't go down this route because I was like, well, we don't know what C is equal to. But the statement doesn't ask which of the following statements could be true, in which case I'd have to verify it for any value of C. It says which of the following statements must be true. So I can pick whatever the hell I want for C. Suppose I let C equal zero just to try to make the math work out nicely. Well, then I could verify the validity of this statement just by plugging in X equals zero. Since I have F of X written explicitly now, I could calculate F of zero, clearly it's equal to zero, and then I could compare that with the negative of the value of F of two. That coming from plugging in zero on this side. Well, let's see, this would be the negative of one third times two cubed, in other words, eight thirds, minus one half times two squared, in other words, two, plus two. Is this thing equal to zero? No, what's it equal to? I don't care, it's not zero. I mean, I guess it's negative eight thirds, but the point is it's not zero. F of zero is not equal to the negative of F of two, therefore B can't possibly be the answer. And you're like, oh, you screwed up. It doesn't say this is true for zero is less than or equal to X less than or equal to two. It says it's true for X strictly greater than zero and strictly less than two. That's true, but because our function F is continuous, those two statements are equivalent. Think about it this way. If f of zero and the negative of f of two are different and our function's continuous, then consider f of 0 0.0000001 or something and negative f of 1.9999999. You get arbitrarily close to these x values. We're gonna get arbitrarily close to these y values. So the fact that this criteria does not hold for this version of the function when x equals zero means that the statement won't hold for this version of the function for all values where x is greater than zero. So statement B, while not necessarily false, is not always true. Therefore, it's not the right answer as we already knew when we figured out that C was the right answer. I'm fairly certain there's better ways to evaluate the validity of these five statements, but it's Saturday afternoon and I gotta get out of here. I'm gonna go have some fun. Maybe I'll let you guys flex your mathematical skills and just add whatever methods you think are clever to the comment section.